John chapter 11. We're going to begin today at verse number 32. And we're going to read through verse number 45. John chapter 11, verses 32 through 45. I do want to tell you, we are going to be adding some lighting uh, because the video is a little bit on the dark side, I noticed, you know, it's a little bit yellow. We will be adding some lighting in order to lighten this up a little bit uh, in the near future. We do everything in our power to make our online ministry as quality as we possibly can. Uh, this ministry, I have been involved in uh, internet ministry now for a number of years. We have been sharing our services, our videos uh, on YouTube and Facebook and Vimeo and Daily Motion and GodTube and a number of other avenues for many, many years. And um, you'll notice our new channel for the new work here in Alabama only has videos that began with our first service and some of the promotional videos that I've created for the ministry. That is because we want uh, the website and we want everything related to the ministry in Alabama, we want it to be its own. You know, we want it to stand alone. However, if you're interested in going back and looking at our ministry over the past 20 years that we were in Dallas, Texas. Uh, you can also look at our Grace Oasis DFW channel on YouTube. Just punch in the words Grace Oasis followed by DFW and you will see uh, that channel come up on YouTube and you can look at years and years and years of preaching and teaching uh, that we did in Dallas, Texas if that will help you to be a little more um, familiar with our work, if that will help you to be a little more comfortable possibly with coming and being part of our church, then by all means I encourage you to go and look at some of our uh, former teaching and preaching online. Amen. Praise God. John chapter 11, verses 32 through 45. Going to talk to us for a while today on the topic, do what you can. Do what you can. John 11, 32 through 45, the King James text today reads, Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, Thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. 
And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. Hallelujah. I'll try to keep this succinct today because I went so long with my earlier comments. But I want to talk to us today on the topic. Do what you can. If you bow your heads with me a moment, Master, Savior, we love you today, Jesus. You're a wonderful Savior. You're a wonderful Redeemer. There is no relationship on this earth that is more important to me and to us than the relationship we have with you. We're grateful, Lord, for the plan of salvation. We're grateful for the revelation of the power of Jesus' name. We're grateful for the infilling, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost and power, which enables us to stamp on demons and to walk victorious in this life as we strive to be a witness and a testimony to a lost and dying world. Now, God, the hour is come when the word of God must go forth. What a fool I would be to try to minister the word of God without first invoking the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We need the anointing. Every man, every woman that would ever dare to stand in the sacred desk. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Else our words should fall upon the ear of the hearer and simply fall to the ground without ever having made their mark and finding their place in the heart of the one that hears. It is the wings of the Spirit that brings the Word of God past our hearing and into our very spirit. Master, in the name of Jesus, and on every word, help me to speak boldly. Help me to speak with divine authority. Help me to speak in love. Let every soul that hears me today be able and willing to receive that which the Spirit of God has given me to deliver to the church at this time. We ask it all in the precious, sacred name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. There are times in our most difficult hour that the Lord will ask us to step out in faith and to do something that will precede a miracle. Hallelujah. Did you hear what I just said? I said sometimes in our most difficult hour, the Lord asks us to step out in faith and do something that will precede a miracle. At the tomb of Lazarus in our primary text today, the Lord could have done everything to facilitate the miracle of Lazarus' resurrection. Yet he didn't. He could have done everything. Tommy, he didn't have to ask them to roll away the stone. He could have spoken of the stone and told the stone to move. Mm -hmm. My Lord, have mercy. I'm going to tell you something. Too many people sit around all the time waiting for God to do everything. Hello now. Too many people sit around on their laurels doing absolutely nothing waiting for God to give them <coughs> the miracle that they so desperately need. 
And the Lord is saying, not till you get up and do something. Hello now. Hallelujah. No, 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 no. I'm going to make you part of the process. I'm going to make you part of this miracle. You're going to be involved in this thing. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Oh, I want to tell you, folks. Oh, there are times when a miracle is so close, and yet we can't see it. The Lord came to Mary and Martha. Mary ran to him with her great declaration of faith. Oh, Lord, if you'd have been here sooner, my brother had not died. Well, aren't you just full of faith, Mary? Aren't you one who really believes in the power of God that operates through this man, Jesus Christ? No, she's not. Many of us think we're such people of faith. We think, oh man, I'll tell you, I've got all the faith in the world. I can believe God for anything. This week, I got a, I got a feeling this message is going to beat me up this week. <laughs> you know, sometimes when I preach, folks, the, the Lord literally will use the message I'm preaching to knock me over the head. Sometimes we look at our circumstance and we are able to see, listen to me, we're able to see what the Lord could have done if only. Oh my Lord, have mercy. But we can't see what he still is capable of doing. And do you see the Lord's reaction? Every time he got people coming to him, all so full of faith, Lord, I know what you could have done if only. Come into Huntsville, come in here to Alabama. I'm afraid sometimes that I'm thinking to myself, Lord, I know what you could have done here if only there had been a sinner. If there had only been a publication we could have advertised in. If only this, if only that. Hello now, I was just talking about it earlier, wasn't I? Mm -hmm. Amen. I was talking about all the things that I look for and all the things that facilitate a work and make a work easier. But does the work being easier mean that it now is impossible for God? No. 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 It just means now we got to keep our ear open. And we got to listen for the direction of the Holy Ghost because God may want to tell us something we need to do. Hello now, listen to me carefully, children. In order that he might perform a bigger miracle than he could have performed yesterday. Hmm. Oh my Lord, have mercy. Back in 2000, I was laying in a hospital bed. The doctors gave me up for dead. They said that I had 24 hours to live. They told my mother that, my family that, for a full month. They said he has about 24 hours to live. He'll be, he'll be gone before the day is out over and over and over and over and over again. They told my family this. They told my mother that. And yet somehow I kept hanging in there and I kept remaining on this planet. I kept breathing even though they had me on a breathing machine. I was on full life support. Somehow or another, I, I just didn't expire. I, I just kept hanging in there. For a year and a half, I had been so sick that it wasn't even funny. For a year and a half, I had struggled and struggled <coughs> with terrible digestive issues, and I was losing weight and getting thin, and oh my Lord, the, the stuff I went through was horrible. Experiencing not to be ugly, but experiencing diarrhea constantly, constantly. I couldn't eat now except that five, ten minutes later, everything I ate now would come straight through me, literally. Just like, like there was a, a pipe from my throat out of me. <sighs> Took him a year and a half to figure out I had a parasite in my intestine that apparently I picked up in Europe. While I was over in the United Kingdom visiting Scotland and England, apparently I ate or drank something because this parasite is not common to the United States. It's something that is common over there but not here. And wouldn't you know, I was the lucky guy that got it. <laughs> Took me a year and a half to figure out I had it, and by then I was dying. 
for a year and a half. I prayed, God heal me. God heal me. Lord, touch me. I need you to touch me, Lord. Lord, I can't do the work you've called me to do if I'm dead. Lord, I need you to touch me. I need you to heal me. I need you to help me. And guess what? He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. It got worse. It got worse. It got worse. All of a sudden, I'm on my deathbed. All of a sudden, the doctors are saying, I've got 24 hours to live at best. Was God any less able to heal me on my deathbed than he was weeks earlier or months earlier or a year and a half earlier? Not in the least. When it was all said and done, he gave me a miracle on that deathbed that baffled the doctors and confounded the scientists. And there were doctors that came, literally came, to meet me afterwards because they could not figure out how I defied death. My own doctor told me. He said, Charles, I can't even begin to tell you what to expect from this day forward because I have never seen anyone survive what you've just come through. He said, I've been in medicine a long time and nobody has ever ever survive what you just came through. So I can't even begin to tell you what to expect from this day forward. Oh, children, I want to tell you, <laughs> the Lord didn't come while Lazarus was sick. The Lord didn't come while Lazarus was dying. The Lord came after Lazarus was long dead. Hallelujah. Not only was he dead, but by now he was four days dead. And he had not been embalmed. He had not been prepared in any manner that would allow his body not to begin the process of rotting and decaying. By now, he stinks. By now, it is so far beyond time that anything can be done oh but Mary <laughs> don't you know that I am more than a healer hallelujah I am the resurrection and the life <laughs> oh glory to God not only not only can I heal but I can also raise the dead <laughs> glory to God I'm here to tell you today child of God it doesn't matter where you're at it doesn't oh how I'm going to shout a little today I feel Pentecost on me today oh I want to tell you something. it doesn't matter how bad you're circumstance looks. It doesn't matter how negative. It doesn't look. Uh, it doesn't matter what you see with your naked eye. I'm here to tell you today, your God is bigger than your circumstance. Your God is not only able to heal when somebody's sick and when somebody's dying, He's also able to raise the dead. Glory to God. Don't cut God out yet. Hallelujah. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Don't count God out yet. But keep your ear open. Keep listening. Because every once in a while, before the miracle comes, listen to me, folks. The Spirit of the Lord will speak to us and say, Do what you can. <laughs> Do what you can. The Lord did not ask the men at the graveside of Lazarus. Listen to me closely. God did not ask them. The Lord did not ask them to do something that they could not do. I want to tell you a little secret. God will never ask you to do something you cannot do. Oh, when that preacher gets up in the pulpit tells you, you need to change who you are. You need to change your orientation. You've got to become something that you are not. And you know good and bloody well that that is not within your purview. That is not something that you're capable of doing. Am I telling the truth? I got news for you, honey. That demand has not come from God because God never asks us to do something that we cannot do. 
He didn't ask the men at Lazarus' grave site to do something they couldn't do, but he did ask them to do what they could do. Oh, my Lord. You see, according to Hebrew law, a Jew could not handle a dead body. They had a very short window that they were allowed to prepare the body for burial and to wrap it. But once that body is wrapped and buried, they are not ever to touch it again. Okay? So when the Lord spoke to those men and said, Roll ye away the stone. You'll notice he didn't next say, Bring the body out. Why not? Because they weren't supposed to touch the body. He didn't ask them to do anything that they couldn't do. And he didn't ask them to do anything that they shouldn't do. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? He did not ask them to do what they could not do. Nor did he ask them to do what they should not do. He only asks us to do what we can. Hallelujah. Oh my Lord. Look at what happened following the Lord's resurrection. As it's described in Matthew 27, verses 50 through 53. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. The Lord didn't have to ask those men to roll that stone away. On the cross, he spoke and rocks began to break in pieces and the earth shook. Are you listening to me, children? He could have moved that stone without their help. He didn't need their help to move that stone. After the resurrection, the Word of God said the graves opened and many of the saints which slept got up from their sleeping place and began to walk around town. Hallelujah! I imagine bearing witness that Jesus the Christ has spoken to them in the bowels of hell. For the word of God tells us that during his three days in the grave, the Lord descended into hell and spoke to the spirits there. I imagine those saints got up from their grave and said, did we have us some church down there? I'll tell you what, Messiah came and let us know that he had arrived. And he said it was time to lead captivity Timothy captive. Hallelujah. It was time to lead us out of that holy place. Glory to God. Every one of us who had been waiting and longing for his arrival. Every one of us followed him straight out of that place of darkness and into the glories of heaven. But I guess the Lord wanted me to come tell y'all what happened because here I am. I was just laying there. Suddenly I woke up and I was wrapped up in my grave clothes. And my goodness have mercy. It took me some doing, but I got out of them. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, the Lord didn't need those men to move that stone. We know from other anecdotes in Scripture that he easily could have caused that stone to move one way or another. He could have kicked his foot to the ground and caused an earthquake. And that stone could have rent in twain. And Lazarus simply could have come through the broken rock. But he didn't. Instead, he asked those that stood by, Roll ye away the stone. Take ye away the stone. The stone. <sighs> Lord, why in the world did you ask those men to move that stone? Did you not tell us that we could simply speak to an obstacle? No matter how big or even seemingly 
permanent it might be, and it would uproot itself and move into the sea. In Matthew 21, 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. In Matthew 17 and 20, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. If the Lord told his disciples, that all they had to do was speak to an obstacle as giant and as permanent as a mountain. And that mountain would uproot itself and be cast into the sea. Why did he feel it necessary to ask these men to take away the stone? Are you following my logic? There was no need for him to ask these men to do what they could. It was not necessary that these men be involved in the process at all. But there had to be some logic. There had to be some reason for the Lord's commanding the grieving Jews to move the stone from the mouth of Lazarus' tomb. First of all, you need to understand today, folks, obedience breeds miracles. I'll tell you, more people lose out on miracles in their lives because they refuse to obey the voice of God. More people lose out on blessing. More people lose out on divine favor. More people lose out on uh, healing and deliverance simply because they refuse to listen to the voice of the Lord. When I was 16 years old, the Spirit of God spoke to me. Never forget it as long as I live. The Lord had told me when I was, He had called me to preach when I was 8. By the time I was about 12, he told me that I would never have the opportunity to go to a Bible college. That was something I wanted more than anything in this world. I wanted to be able, like so many pastors I had had and so many preachers that I knew, I had wanted so much to be able to go to a Bible college. And even as early as 12 years old, I was looking forward to the day when I'd be able to go to Bible college. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, you will never go to a Bible college. You will never be able to attend. And I said, Lord, what are you talking about? Why in the world would you tell me that? Well, I'll tell you why he told me. Because once I knew that, I began to study the Word of God in earnest, and I began to study the Word of God with passion, and I began, my mother could tell you, oh, I used to go down to my bedroom after school, and I would read and study the Word. I don't mean just read it, I mean study it. I had won a concordance, a Strong's Concordance, in a contest at my church. And I would take that concordance and I would be investigating words in the Greek and words in the Hebrew and looking at their original meanings and their truest, purest definitions. And I would begin to do searches and I learned how to trace uh, etymology and trace the history of words and find out how this word uh, had its origins here but it gradually developed and became this here you know and, and it started out meaning this but as time went by it, it took on a new meaning and at 12 years old I began to study the word of God with, with passion and uh, oh I, I just love I still love 
still want to study and research the Word of God. But I started that at 12 years old. Why? Because the Lord told me I was never going to get to go to Bible college. And I thought, well, if Abraham Lincoln could become an attorney without ever going to law school, then I surely can preach without ever going to Bible college. So I began to study and I began to search. And at 16, about four years later, the Lord spoke to me and said, now I want you to go to Texas. I said, Lord, I've never even visited Texas. I've never even been to Texas. The only thing I know about Texas is I have a great aunt, my grandmother's sister, and her husband, my great uncle, and she has three kids, two of which are married and grown and have families of their own. The youngest is a few years older than me, and she still lives at home. I said, Lord, they live there in Fort Worth, but I don't know anything about Texas. I've never been. Why in the world would you want me to go to Texas? And the Lord said to me, you've got to remember, folks, I was 16. This was literally within about two months of my 16th birthday. I had just turned 16. He said, you're going to preach faith. And if you're going to preach faith, then you have to learn how to live by faith. I said, oh my goodness, okay. He, said, you're, he told me, he said, I'm going to train you in Texas. I'm going to train you for your ministry. So, I told my mother, I was working a job at a lo local grocery store. I made the money. I bought me a plane ticket. I was scared out of my mind to fly. I was scared out of my mind to fly. Back in those days, I had a fear of heights that just, you can't even imagine how terrified I was of high places, never mind being in an airplane that didn't connect it to, a, you know, that wasn't part of a tall building. I literally could not even go up in a high building. Our a group of our young people from church had gone to New York City at one point, and I went with them. And they went up to the top of the Empire State Building and I wouldn't go up. I stayed downstairs because I couldn't go up. I was terrified of heights. But when God tells you to do something, honey, only a fool refuses to do it. Even at 16, I knew that if God tells you something, there must be a miracle, there must be a blessing, there must be prosperity, there must be divine favor. Something has to follow because obedience breeds miracles. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I made my way to say, I called my great aunt, I said, could I stay with you a while until I can get my own place and, and get myself set up? She said, sure. So I went down to Texas I wound up going to her church. Now, I grew up in the Assemblies of God. My great aunt was part of the Church of God out of Cleveland, Tennessee. The Church of God in Fort Worth that she attended was an old-fashioned Pentecostal holiness church. And I'm going to tell you something, honey. That church had a reputation worldwide, worldwide, as a place where the Holy Ghost moved like he moved a hundred years ago. And I walked into that church my very first Sunday. Never had been there before. Never had visited. Never didn't know nothing about it. Hadn't seen nothing yet. I walked into the building. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I walked into the building and the minute I stepped through the door of that building... It was like chains fell off of me. I felt this liberty, this freedom, like I had never felt in my life. And they began to worship, and they began to sing some songs, and they didn't sing hymns. They didn't sing choruses. They sang all the old hymns, you know, and mostly Southern Gospel-style hymns, you know. And they started singing a hymn, a song that I had never heard before. His love lights the way for me. I've left the old paths I've traveled so long. I'm happy, redeemed, and free. Of Jesus, my Lord, I sing a sweet song. His love lights the way for me. 
Ooh, all of a sudden, I never heard that song before. All of a sudden, that song began to come alive in my spirit. All of a sudden, I was feeling something inside of me. It was like this explosion of joy. It was just the most wonderful, oh my goodness, the most wonderful feeling I ever felt in my life. It just began to well up in me and well up in me. And then they got to a verse that said, The pleasures of sin no more I desire, no good in them now I see. The Spirit has set my being on fire. Honey, that's all I could hear. All of a sudden, I, I didn't even realize I was doing it. All of a sudden, I leaped up off of that pew and I started dancing all over that church and I started and I was the only person in the entire sanctuary who was dancing. I've never been to this church at all. I didn't even see anybody dance, so I didn't know that that was even acceptable in that church. But see, nobody had to tell me because the liberty of the Holy Ghost, I could feel the liberty the minute I walked through the door. It was like God was telling my spirit, you are free to worship me. You are free to let your spirit worship me. You're free to worship me here in spirit and in truth. And I mean to tell you, when they hit that line, the spirit has set my being on fire. This 16-year-old jumped up on his feet and began to dance and dance and dance and dance. Whew. What an experience. Long story short, I wound up becoming a part of the Church of God. I pastored two churches on behalf of the Church of God early in my pastoral career. My experience in Fort Worth was mind-blowing. It was the most wonderful Time I've ever had in my life. Did was everything roses and peach flavored tea? No. <laughs> was everything you know cotton candy and cake? No. Did I go through some hardships? Did I go through some tough times? Did I struggle? Oh yeah. But let me tell you something. Overall. I wound up in a church that I never, ever, ever would have been exposed to if I had not obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I wound up under the tutelage of Pastor J.T. Gillum, an old-timey Pentecostal holiness man of God. Let me tell you something. That man and his wife were the personification of love, folks. This was not a church preaching hellfire and brimstone. This wasn't a church preaching everybody into hell. That man preached Jesus like nobody's business. That man preached the Holy Ghost like it was going out of style. That man preached faith. That man preached miracles. That man preached healing. And every Sunday you saw it happening. Every Sunday we saw people, drug addicts, come to the altar and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. And they they got up from that altar never again the rest of their life to touch a drug. Alcoholics. My God. The things I saw there. The miracles that I saw. People were healed left and right. My God. Miracles were commonplace. And a little church didn't have on an average Sunday but about 200 people in it. But honey, the Spirit of the Lord would fall in that church. And I'm here to tell you, they had no windows on their sanctuary. It was a windowless sanctuary. And I'm telling you, a shout would go up in that congregation. Them ladies and those men would start to shout. And they let out a hoop and a holler. Woo! That's how we shout. Say, oh, that's crazy. That doesn't belong in church. No, I guess it only belongs on the football field, don't it? I guess it only belongs at the Beyonce concert, don't it? 
I'm sorry if my worship of my God is too real for you. I'm sorry if I get a little too excited for you. I'm sorry if you think worship's supposed to be dead and dry and dreary and funeral-like. My Bible said, Oh, clap your hands, all the key people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is terrible, meaning awe-inspiring. He is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us. The excellency of Jacob, whom he loved, Selah. God is caught up with a shout. A shout with the voice of time. Sing praises to him. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our king. Sing praises. Oh, I'm sorry if shouting doesn't fall into your definition of worship. I got news for you. I'm not trying to be mean, but I have to say this. I guarantee you the two LGBT friendly churches in Huntsville don't believe in shouting, but this preacher does. Hallelujah. And if you're somebody out there and you believe in the move of God and you believe in the power of God and you believe in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost and you believe in worship worshiping in spirit and in truth, then honey, there is now a church in Huntsville for you. Hallelujah. Whether you're straight, gay, blind, or ugly. Hallelujah. Yes. Obedience breeds miracles. No one knew what the Lord was about to do at the tomb of Lazarus. For all they knew, he simply wanted to go into the tomb and see the body of his friend. As an observant Jew, he would not be able to handle the body in any way. So when the Lord asked the mourners to move the stone, they were not privy as to why he was asking them to do so. I'm going to tell you something, folks. When God asks you or tells you to do something, if you think you deserve an explanation, if you think God has to explain himself and tell you why he's asking you to do something, then you don't understand how this thing works. No, sir. When the master says, move the stone, <laughs> I'm going to move the stone. Mm -hmm. I don't need to know what he's about to do. I don't need to know what his plans are. All I know is every time God's ever asked me to do anything, something good come from it. Right. Hallelujah. Oh my God. Did you hear me today? Every time the Lord asked me to do something, something good came from it. Look at John 21, 3 through 6. Simon Peter saith unto them, meaning the other disciples, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? You wonder why this preacher often says when I'm preaching, I'll say children, right? I'm not saying that because you're my kids. I'm saying that because you're his kids, okay? Amen. I'm trying to remind you that you're a child of God. That's why I use that phrase. He said, children, have ye any meat? They answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. All I know is when Jesus tells somebody to do something, it always ends well. Hmm. I don't need to know why. I don't need to understand. There's an old song my Aunt Dorothy and Uncle Travis used to say, and you've heard it, many of you have heard it over the years. I don't need to understand. I just need to hold his hand. I don't ever have to ask 
the reason why for I know he'll make a way through the night and through the day I don't need to understand I just need to hold his hand I don't need to understand when the Lord asks me, I don't need to understand. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to get happy. I'm telling you, I'm going to get happy as sure as I'm alive. I don't need to understand why God opened the door for us to come to Huntsville, Alabama. I don't have to understand why this is where God put us. Hallelujah. All I need to do is obey. Hallelujah. Because obedience breeds miracles. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Sometimes we don't fully understand why the Lord asks us to do certain things, but the key is obedience. We don't know what the Lord might have done had the men not removed the stone as he asked. Why do we not know what he might have done? Well, because they did. <laughs> We can often find, listen, we can often find a thousand reasons for disobeying the Lord. We can often find a thousand reasons for thinking that what the Lord is asking us to do is a bad idea. Lord, I think it's a bad idea to send us to Alabama. I think it's a bad idea to send us to Huntsville. Lord, why well, that place is full of negativity and homophobia. That place is full of religious demons that don't understand grace and don't understand people and don't understand how this gospel works. Lord, I think it's a bad idea. But I want you to rest assured today the enemy will always be present to whisper in our ear as Mary said to the Lord that day, by this time he stinketh. For he hath been dead four days. Oh, the enemy's always going to give you some reason for why obeying the Lord is a bad idea. Am I telling you the truth? Yeah, yeah. But obedience breeds miracles, folks. Secondly, today, faith is essential to miracles. And faith without action is dead. Why must we do what we can? Because faith without action is dead. In James chapter 2 verses 15 through 18. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. And one of you say unto them. Depart in peace. Be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, meaning action, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. You want to know if this pastor's got faith in God? You want to know whether or not I've got faith? I can tell you I've got faith till the cows come home. And I can do nothing to demonstrate that faith. Or take a look at what I'm doing. Take a look at where I am. Take a look at my actions. Take a look. See. Come on now. <laughs> oh, honey, I'm already trying to get this ball rolling. I'm already trying to do a work for the Lord. I'm already trying to get this thing going here in Alabama. Why? Because I don't need to tell you I got faith. You can see my faith by what? By my actions. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You see, obedience breeds miracles, and obedience is essential to miracles because obedience is the demonstration of our faith. In Luke chapter 17, verses 12 through 14, And as he entered into a certain village, there, were, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. 
And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master. It's interesting they use the term Master. Have mercy on us. They were not disciples. They weren't following the Lord. Why did they call him Master? Well, let's keep, let's keep on with the story. Have mercy on us, verse 14. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. <laughs> Too many Christians call him master. But when he tells them to do something, without an explanation as to why, they do nothing. Mm -hmm. These men called out Jesus, Master. What does that imply? That implies whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. Because if you're the Master, I'm your servant. Hallelujah. The Lord said, go and show yourself to the priest. Well, now listen, the language he used implied that they were healed because what a person with leprosy would do, if the leprosy somehow miraculously cleared up and went away, there was a process in the law of Moses whereby they would have to go and present themselves to the priest and then they'd have to make an offering. And here the Lord is saying that go and show yourself to the priest. I've still got leprosy. But he said go and show yourself to the priest. You know what? Nothing but good comes when you do what the Lord asks you to do. Oh, hallelujah. Whenever Jesus says, do what you can, <laughs> you can bet something good is about to happen. You can bet there's a miracle in tow. You can bet there's a healing in the wings. You can bet there's deliverance about to come. Oh, do what you can. I don't ask you to do what you can't, and I don't ask you to do what you shouldn't, but I ask you to do what you can. Mm -hmm. And when I ask you, don't ask me why, don't ask for explanations, do what I've told you to do. Hallelujah, why? Because obedience breeds miracles. Obedience is the evidence, the action evidence of our faith. Many believers ask the Lord to intervene in their situation and then they sit back and wait for the Lord to act. But God has called us to be a people of faith. Listen to me. Faith never sits still. If we say we have faith and yet we sit still and do nothing, our faith is in vain. But when we put feet to our faith and act in such a manner as to prepare for the miracle we anticipate, we can rest assured that the miracle we seek is soon to arrive. Hallelujah. The Lord does not ask us to do everything, nor does He ask us to do what we cannot or what we should not. But often he asks us to do what we can. Listen to me now. So that he can do what we cannot. Hallelujah. He'll ask us to do what we can so that he can do what we cannot. In closing today, the greatest advice ever uttered was spoken by Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the marriage in Cana of Galilee, when she said, John chapter 1, verses 2 through 5, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. 
Verse 5. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. <laughs> Whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. That's the best advice that could ever be given a child of God. Whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. Do what you can. You know why? I raised this kid, and I, I've observed something. Any time he asked you to do anything, something good came from it. Hallelujah. Every time the Lord speaks, every time he makes any kind of request of us, he's not He's not asking because he needs you to do something for him. He could have moved the stone at Lazarus too all by himself. He did not need them to move the stone. That's not why he asked them. Oh, but he let them be part of the miracle. He let them be part of the process. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of times when God wants to allow us to be part of the miracle. He wants to allow us to be part of the blessing. He wants to allow us to be part of something supernatural and wonderful. And all he asks us to do is do what we can. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. If you'd stand with me this afternoon.